the summer of 1950, recruits for the Air Force were arriving at training bases in increasing numbers. There was a mean war on over in Korea. And so far, things weren't going well for our side. The Reds were pushing our ground forces all the way back to the Pusan perimeter. Our air strength was proving the biggest single factor in keeping us from being driven off the peninsula. That air strength had to be kept up and increased. This called for a program of intensive training in all phases of maintenance and operation. Naturally, there was a lot of emphasis on the training of pilots. When the Reds suddenly struck in Korea in June 1950, our problem in logistics was immediate and tremendous. For this was a war on the other side of the biggest of oceans. Supplies for our ground forces as well as our air forces had to be airlifted in huge quantities every day. The Military Air Transport Service under the skilled command of Lieutenant General Lawrence S. Cuter met all requirements efficiently and continuously. The Pacific Airlift was a well-oiled engine of supply. The civilian airlines were called on for help and at once turned over 66 transport aircraft and their crews to be used in the airlift. Before long, there were 206 airplanes in operation, including the converted civilian airliners and aircraft of the military air transport service. It was the biggest wartime operation of its kind in history. By September 1950, when the Korean conflict was three months old, the Mats Pacific Airlift was averaging 250,000 airplane miles per day. The Pacific Airlift transports landed their cargoes in Japan in 30 or more flights every day. Here, it was the job of the Combat Cargo Command, organized and commanded by Major General William H. Tunner, to haul men and supplies to the Korean battle zone. While our ground forces were being driven back to the Pusan perimeter, our overall strength was fast building up, and a vital part of that strength was in the more than 100 tons of supplies that Matz was delivering every day. One day late in August of this fateful year of 1950, a C-47 from Japan arrived at the Tegu airfield inside the Pusan perimeter. Our big push to the north was in preparation, and there was to be a conference of top-level commanders representing all three of the armed services. The naval group was headed by Admiral Joy and Vice Admiral Struble, commander of Joint Task Force 7. Our air strength was represented by the commander of the 5th Air Force, Major General Partridge, and by Lieutenant General Stratemeyer, head of the Far East Air Forces with headquarters in Tokyo. Lieutenant General I.H. Edwards, Acting Deputy Chief of Staff, Operations USAF, came from Washington for the conference. In the air action that followed, in the 10 days or so just before the Incheon landing, the workhorses were the B-29s. We had 140 of them ready for business. Their mission was twofold, to neutralize the enemy ground forces that still surrounded the Pusan perimeter in considerable numbers, and to attack all Korean airfields in enemy hands. Our air forces flew more than 3,000 sorties in the week before the Incheon operation. In a huge area around Incheon, the B-29s went after marshalling yards, tunnels, rail lines, anything useful to enemy logistics. These Air Force operations left the Reds without any hope of reinforcing or supporting their defenses at Incheon. We were practically unopposed in the air, for we had long since effectively disposed of the Red air strength, which was not going to be troublesome until the MiGs appeared 
later in the year. There was effective bombing of targets of all descriptions. This was the Air Force's way of helping MacArthur in his magnificent operation at Incheon, which was about to begin. On the morning of 15 September 1950, at Incheon, on Korea's west coast, 150 miles behind the front at the Pusan perimeter, our naval elements went to work to soften up the red defense. An unpleasant surprise for the invaders who had taken over nearly the whole peninsula. A 29-foot tide had to be reckoned with in the deployment of the landing craft. General MacArthur witnessed the landing of the 1st Marine Division and the 7th U.S. Infantry Division. The Air Force had done its part by its hammering of the enemy's ground forces, supply lines, and airfields. On the day following the landing at Incheon, the UN forces hemmed in for a month at the perimeter around Busan broke through. Up to now, the Reds had done all the advancing. Now, it was our turn. Our ground forces at the perimeter were now formidable. We had four U.S. infantry divisions, seven South Korean divisions, and one British brigade. At the beginning of the war, our ground forces had had a tough time. But now, everything was going as we wanted it to. Our air effort paved the way for this rapid advance. It had completely knocked out enemy aircraft and airfields. Our troops had nothing to fear from red air action. There wasn't much effective opposition of any kind, as our forces went on to retake the South Korean capital city of Seoul. There was soon to be a large-scale join-up of our ground forces that landed at Incheon with those that had come up from the Pusan perimeter for the advance to the Yalu River. There was still some scattered resistance from the Reds as our men moved farther to the north. In clearing out enemy rear guard units, our people were getting good cooperation from the South Koreans. After the Incheon landing, aircraft of the Combat Cargo Command came through with a tremendous contribution to the success of the whole campaign. What's going to happen is that C-47s and C-119s will pull off one of the best managed airdrops in combat history. And they're going to do it in enemy territory, about 30 miles north of the captured North Korean capital, Pyongyang. And not only troops, ammunition, and food, but jeeps, trucks, and howitzers are going to be delivered in this big drop. The first time in combat history for big stuff, as well as paratroopers and their supplies to be delivered by air in the same drop operation. The objective is to trap as many of the retreating enemy as possible and to strengthen our continued advance to the Yalu. Nearly 4,000 paratroopers and their supplies are going to be dropped in the four-day operation, along with a great deal of heavy equipment. Exercise Swarmer, held earlier in the year in South Carolina, had been a valuable rehearsal for this operation in Korea. Although at the time, nobody realized that the game was going to be played for keeps so soon.
On 1 November 1950, enemy air suddenly re-entered the war in a dangerous way. In other words, the Russian-built MiG-15s made their debut in Korea. Our F-80s take on the MiGs. F-86s have been sent for, but in the meantime, the F-80s do all right. It was in an F-80 that Lieutenant Russell Brown shot down the first MiG, the first of many. Cameras mounted on the wings of our fighters automatically photographed the air battle. As fighting aircraft, the F-80s were decidedly inferior to the MiGs, but our old jets were much better handled. The F-80s more than held their own because of the superior skill of our pilots. Only a little more than a month after the breakthrough at the perimeter and the Incheon landing, virtually all of Korea was in our hands. MacArthur's end of war offensive had gone splendidly. More than 100,000 prisoners were taken by our ground forces in the first five months of the war. A lot of them had frozen feet. It can be mighty cold in the upper reaches of North Korea in late November. Some of our forces got to the Yalu, but this was the terminus of the drive. Policy at the highest level forbade any advance or airstrikes beyond the river. Besides, the Chinese were now in the war. We were faced by a quarter of a million of them. Pretty soon, there was going to be what MacArthur called an entirely new war. The decisive force so far in the Korean conflict was our air power. In spite of the fact that at this time, December 1950, our Air Force was still suffering from the economy budgets that followed World War II. And in the new war, with a new enemy that was about to begin, our side never lost the supremacy of the air. It was safely in the hands of the United States Air Force.